Hi everyone, my name is Dr. John Lane. I'm the Professor of Percussion and Director of Percussion Studies here at Sam Houston State University. I'm absolutely thrilled to be this year's TMEA All-State Percussion Etude Selector. And this Saturday at 12 noon, I'll be doing a virtual clinic as part of the Valley Percussion Festival. We're gonna cover all four etudes. More importantly, I'm gonna answer your questions. So I hope to see you there 12 noon on Saturday. Welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Super stoked, guys, to have you today in another of our uh, live streams, Valley Percussion Festival Live. Super stoked, guys. Super, super stoked uh, for today's um, segment. Uh, every year, uh, the Texas All-State Percussion Auditions, guys, are are a big deal right here in, 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 in Texas. Um, the percussion community in, in Texas, guys, is very, very involved uh, throughout the whole state of Texas. Uh, it's very, very competitive uh, in a positive way, right? The fr friendly competition. And it's always a huge deal when the uh, etudes are released by the professor that selected to uh, select the etudes and present them to us at TBA uh, this year. Uh, gladly we were able to uh, experience it live in person in San Antonio by Dr. John Lane. And man, I think it was so fitting for, for, for uh, TMEA to select him as the etude selector. Uh, I, I think he's done a phenomenal job, as I'm sure you, you, you will be agreeing with me. The etudes that he has chosen are on point, and they're definitely going to help us uh, in the education uh, throughout all of Texas throughout this school year. Um, switching gears just quickly, guys. You noticed I placed a, 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 a video of a DCI. It was Genesis, uh, the drum uh, uh, battery for Genesis Drum and Bugle Core. Uh, we got a lot, a lot of content, guys, that's in the pipeline. It's uh, on the table, and we're working on it already. It's... it's uh, you're going to really like it. The audio quality, as you could hear on it, it's amazing. Uh, I recommend anything that we post, guys, uh, from DCI San Antonio, and literally anything, because that's our goal when we're editing, that everything sounds amazing. You can put on your headphones. You can put on uh, on a good sound system in your cars. Uh, I'll listen to our content in our in my car, guys, and it sounds amazing. So uh, uh, make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, and share our channels, guys. That way, everybody in the percussion community in the world can enjoy these. Good, good, good. And uh, with all that said, guys, uh, get your uh, pen and paper ready, your notebooks, your etudes. Maybe you're going to take notes on them. Um, super stoked for today's artist and clinician guys and uh he needs no introduction we know who he is we know uh the amazing educator that he is i am super proud super stoked to be able to call him a, a colleague a friend and even more stoked to have him here today with us ladies and gentlemen dr john lane sir how are you doing 
I'm doing well, Gil. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everything that you're doing for percussion education. This is really a great opportunity for me uh, to share, but thank you so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, yeah. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We're super stoked. And and, and the thing is, is this, sir, that uh, uh, Valley Percussion Festival, since the founder established it 34 years ago, his name's Robert Botello. Uh, he, uh, he, his idea, sir, was to bring world-class education to uh, South Texas because it started as a live event. That's how it started. Mm -hmm. And his thing was uh, uh, to bring uh, high, you know, world-class educators and and following on on that you know we are super stoked to have you here today because i think you fit the bill and then some great well thank you so much as i said in the the introduction i'm i was thrilled to be asked to be the selector this year i took my job very seriously um i pl i think i played through every single etude and on all of these books uh yeah I, if i don't know if everybody out there knows how the selection process works but basically when, when they contact you to be the selector, there's a certain number of books that TMEA has approved. So the first stage yes. is you choose the book and, th and that's due at a certain date. And then after that, then you choose uh, the etudes. And they, they have us give two choices and then TMEA actually makes the final decision on which etude gets picked. So I, yes. I took a lot of, uh, took my job very seriously. I played through every etude, tried to think of uh, the concepts and techniques and musicality, everything that I felt was important and I do want to say one thing about this, about selecting the materials uh, about these particular etudes. One of the things that I'm, I thought about as I made these selections, and I talked to lots of percussion directors as well as I was going through the process, um, just about like what kinds of things they look for and that type of thing. And uh, one of the things I thought of were those students that, um, uh, you know, are, are competing Maybe they're not going to be all staters, but I want every student to learn something from this process because uh, pretty much everybody in the state is going to be exposed to this and, and do it on some level. So yes. the ones that maybe aren't competitive this year, maybe they grow as a result of doing this and they gain some skills. And uh, regardless of the, you know, the competition, not everybody's going to be an all state, but everybody can approach these etudes and learn something from them. At least that was my, that was my line of thinking as I went through and chose. Sir, I, I think you nailed it solid right on, on the bullseye, sir, with, with your approach, because uh, uh, that's that's usually how, you know, a, a, every percussion educator in Texas uses them. Uh, we, we, of course, try to get our, our, our more advanced kids to, to, to make the Allstate band, but then sure. that's how we develop our other students. And exactly. I, 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 I think you nailed it, sir. I think you nailed it. You did your homework. You did, you did your due diligence. And I think it paid off. We see it in the A2 selection. So great. bravo. Well, I'm sure everybody is clapping their hands at you right now, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, yes, yes, the, yes. Format, uh, the format that I'd like to do is go through each A2. Uh, first, I'll talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes or so. And then I want to hear from everybody out there that's watching if there's any questions or anything in particular that I can go through. Um, if it's helpful, I'm happy to play through them. Uh, I also have the videos that are on Innovative, my reference videos. You can access those at any time. Um, and I also have a series of instructional content on Ensemble Block, which we can talk about later. But I'd like to yes, get started with yes. airdrop. So shall I go ahead and get started? Sir, let's do that. I will exit exit stage left. Uh, viewers, uh, please uh, feel free to enter your questions, guys, as it's going. And maybe we won't address it right then and there. But as soon as the, he opens up the question segments, I'll make sure that every one of your questions is 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 addressed, guys. So put in your questions. If I don't if I don't show it to him quickly, I will in due time. So please, please. Uh, Share your questions, sir. It's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So we're going to get started with the snare drum etude. Um, funny thing about this, this book, uh, it's from the Mitchell Peters Advanced Snare Drum Studies. I've been teaching out of this book since I was in grad school. I, I first got this book as a master's degree student at the University of North Texas. I've been teaching here at Sam Houston. This will be my 16th year of teaching here at Sam Houston, and I've used this book every single year. It's a great book. Uh, lots of great etudes in it, and etude number nine has some uh, some pretty great uh, features to it. So let's. I, I'm just going to kind of talk through it, maybe break some things down, um, 
and then I could play through it and then get to your questions. So first off, some concepts, some key concepts. This is a concert style etude. What that means to me is that it should have the greatest attention to detail that you can imagine. It should have a wide dynamic contrast from pianissimo to fortissimo and everything in between. You should be able to shade those dynamics. One important concept that you need to understand in differentiating a concert style from a rudimental style is that concert style, we, we play emphasized accents. We play the dynamic level but we play emphasized accents, whereas in rudimental style, we have a more uh, defined accent style. So for instance, if I were gonna play a concert style and accent 16th notes uh, like this, something like this, concert style. And let's say that's forte. Okay, if I were playing that in marching style and I was playing forte, the accents would be forte, but everything else would be down here. So that's a, pri a big primary difference between the concert style and uh, rudimental style. So uh, another thing is all the rolls in this one are going to be buzzed. Uh, he uses slash notation, so sometimes you'll see there's three slashes or two slashes. That doesn't matter. They're all concert style buzzed rolls. There's not going to be any uh, double stroke rolls in this one. We want to play musically. Okay, We don't want to play flat. You can use a gogic pulse. You can use the geography of the head to shade the phrasing or color uh, the phrasing that you're choosing. Um, I'll show you some specific places where I use geography to help uh, define the sound of it. Um, you can use a gogic pulse when there's not an accent, but you want to have a feel of having the pulse in there. You can gently uh, use an agogic pulse to help with that. But basically the rule is don't play flat. Play the snare drum like a musical instrument don't play like a robot. Um, okay, let's get into some specifics here. I'll take my pad away and work on the drum. There are two kinds of accents in this piece. I mentioned the, the different style, but there's two kinds. There's housetop accents and then regular accents. So housetop accents, I play with a little more velocity, a little heavier, and I, I actually try to play them a little bit closer to the center of the drum. So um, for instance, here, right in the beginning, those first accents is a regular emphasized accent. And then right here in the center, I do that roll and put it right in the center there. And that's how I differentiate between the accents. And I do that pretty much all the way through. There are some things about the roll. Let's take a look at, if you're following along with your score, this is measure 29. 29 here, um, you have accents and you have rolls, but they're not tied. They're not released. They're lifted. So the way I do that is I play buzz strokes and then I lift. Like that. So it's if in slow motion, it's right. So it's two buzz strokes and then a lift. So no release. That happens again uh, several times in the piece over at measure 86, 87. And I think those are the two spots where that happens. But those are lifted rolls, okay? Now, the other rolls in the piece are tied, and they have release points. Uh, sometimes, like in measure four and five, they're accented. That one's pretty easy to hear. But like in measure 37 and 38, these release points are on these two 16th notes. We want to hear those notes clearly. So when I play that uh, passage... I want to hear those 16th notes. And sometimes that can be tricky to articulate that. We don't want to hear, right? We want to hear both notes evenly. Okay, so that, ha again, that happens throughout the piece, the difference between lifted rolls and tied rolls. Now, um, it's important when you're starting this etude to figure out, you know, you're probably going to be playing it slower than 80 beats per minute, right? I don't recommend starting it, learning it at tempo, although you could do that. Uh, but you do want to figure out what your roll bass is going to be. My roll bass throughout this is 16th notes. So if you're thinking 80 beats per minute, then 16th notes. And that serves as a pretty good basis for the roll all the way through. Um, 
One exception, and I do mine, I do stay with 16th notes, but one place that you could try uh, playing around with that is at measure 73, these sort of longer rolls. Um, I have a whole series of videos about developing your roll on Ensemble Block. Um, they're also on my YouTube page. Um, and basically, I have this whole system. I, I won't go into it now because it's, it's a whole clinic in and of itself. But softer rolls, you can play with a slower hand speed. And then louder rolls with a faster hand speed. Um, you could use that concept here, but you, the main thing is that you're keeping time. So at measure 73. I just keep it as 16th notes. I don't try the slow down, speed up thing, but you could. And if you practice keeping it in time, practice with your metronome, uh, you might use that. The main point is that these beautiful rolls over here at 73 and 81, it's a great chance to show off your roll development. How soft can you play that beautiful roll and, and that beautiful shape there? Okay, that's a great opportunity to show showcase your roll. Uh, flam passages. Okay, we've all heard our teachers say, what? Keep your grace notes low. <laughs> all right? It's pretty easy to play a good flam. You got to keep your grace notes low. And there's a couple of exposed passages here. You can work on this. Measure 41. What I do here is I keep all the flams on my right hand. And I do that so that I can play consistently with the dynamic and each flam consistently. And I can keep that grace note nice and low. So as soon as you start, if you start lifting up your left hand in those grace notes, you're going to start getting those flat flams. And that's what we want to avoid. All right. Um, the other thing I do, I don't know if you can see it very well. I'll tilt the camera down just a little bit. One thing that I do is... And I do this a lot in this piece, is when I have grace notes, I use the geography to help with the separation between the grace note and the primary note by just moving the, the grace note a little bit closer to the edge. So as my flams come to the center and that crescendo measure 41, my left hand trails my right hand a little bit. And what that does is it helps to bring out the primary note. It, gives, it makes it more prominent. I do that same thing for the four stroke rough at measure 34. I put the grace notes here and I put the primary note there. And by the way, I use a right, left, left sticking on that four stroke. So in slow motion, it's this. So that's a really good trick that you can use. Remember I talked about earlier, the, uh, I mentioned this idea of using the geography to shade. That's a good point. Um, and then, of course, when the, with the loud flams, same thing, keeping the grace notes loud, keeping the grace notes low. Okay. This brings me to uh, measure 53 and 54. This can be really challenging to play those 30-second notes there. They're quite fast. Um, and if, if you're in an audition and you get nervous or, you know, if not nervous, you're excited, your adrenaline's pumping because you're, you're performing, you're, you're under the spotlight, um, the first thing to go are these fast twitch muscles. And you probably all experience some kind of symptoms of being nervous. I do, and I still get nervous when I play. But I've learned to... Uh, counteract those symptoms. And one of the things that I learned when, when playing soft on snare drum that helps me to counteract that is to open up the angle a little bit, hold a little more firmly at my fulcrum, and use my arms. What that does is it, it takes out the fast twitch muscles a little bit, and it focuses more on the fulcrum and your arm, which are not going to shake or, or move. So you solidify that, use your arm a little bit more, and you can play, can play nice and, and crisp. The other thing that it does, which is a side benefit, is it makes your soft uh, dynamic level have a little more presence and depth to it. It's not just surface sound. I hear that sometimes with students. Sometimes you might want that super light sound, but... In this case, I think not. I think you want to have presence and you want to make sure that you're playing very exactly here. 
Okay, and the last sort of um, major point where I talked about earlier here, I can tilt this back up now. I talked earlier about uh, not playing robotically and how important it is to play musically in shading and uh, you can use a gogic pulse, uh, put phrasing in there, all of that stuff. Everything that you're going to do over on the mallets, you should do here, okay? This is a musical instrument as well, capable of melody, even though we don't hear it necessarily as melody, but we should think it that way. We should feel it in our bodies that way. So uh, I'm talking too much. At measure 89, there's this big uh, section here from 89 down to, to the end of that phrase. Uh, those phrases is at 105. That section ends there. Um, this is like, I know how I'm going to walk in and hear a freshman go, we'll play it flat like that. Don't do that, okay? Nobody needs to hear that. That's great for Metallica if you're playing in a metal band. Not great for concert snare drums. So here, use a gogic pulse and direction. I'll show you how I play this one. I play it like this. Even that last little phrase, ba, da, 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 da. Even though it's super soft, giving it just a little bit of a pulse there, I think is really important. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the major key concepts, the, the things that I'm really paying attention to. Um, let me show you one more little little thing. It's a little thing, but it's a good one. Over at measure 13 and 14 and 15, what I do right here is it's another example of using the geography to help. Um, color or differentiate with these accents. So here you're at forte and you've got accents and you've got 30 second notes like that. Now, if you play that all in the same spot on the head, it's a little bit harder to hear those accents clearly. But if you'll bring the accent just a little bit closer to the center, I don't know if that's coming across on the computer there, but it certainly sounds clearer here. Uh, so that's how I achieve clarity on those accents that happen uh, so quickly right there. Um, all right, guys, that's, uh, those are my, my key points, and I'm ready to hear from you. I'd love to hear your questions, uh, anything uh, that you'd like to, uh, like to ask. Now is a great time to do that. If there are any questions, I'll, I'll address those now. So far, there doesn't seem to be any questions, sir. Okay, great. Uh, but as soon as, as soon as they pop on, sometimes, sometimes, well, if you can play the etude, that would be great. Uh, okay. If you want to switch to another instrument, totally up to you. Uh, a lot of the times, they'll 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 compile towards the answer. So, but as soon okay. as they come up, I'll make sure I put them on the screen for you. Okay, I'll go ahead and just play through it. I mean, it's only like a minute okay. long. Okay, I just got some of them uh, really quick. Oh, um, you got questions. I'm gonna, okay, great. I'm, I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it on the screen. Okay. What's a good way to count the snare drum etude? Okay, great question. Um, so the way that I the way that I think of it is I, I kind of think of it is a fast three, like one, two, three, because the tempo is here. One, two, three, one, two, three. So you can kind of feel it in one. So one, two, three, one, two, three, ba, da, da, ba, is, da, 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 ba, is, da, 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 So I think feeling it in one or feeling it as a fast three is is the best way to to count it. If you're talking about like what syllables to use to count it, uh, there's there's different ways to do that. Uh, in, in music theory class, we learned the one ta la ta lita, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of, when I work with my students, I, that's great for theory class um, and, and, you know, one and two and three and all of that stuff. I usually speak drum, drummies. And the reason I do that is because I think for, for us, um, like we're, we need to be able to connect it to our, to our bodies, to our humanness. That's how we're going to become good musicians. So you need to be able to sing the thing. So slow it down. Uh, a little bit. You can feel it in a fast three, feel it in one, and then just learn how to sing it. I think the most important thing 
for understanding the counting of this etude is knowing where the eighth note lines up in the measure. Um, and uh, there's a tricky spot, you know, at measure 17 and 18, one and three and two and one. So you want to be able to know where the eighth note goes there. Ba, 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 ba. It almost feels like it goes into two. It's a hemiola. Um, anyway, th so that's something that I would encourage you to work with your teacher on. But feel the eighth note. Know where the eighth note lines up with the 16th note. And then sing the phrases one measure at a time if you need to. Good. Any other questions? Awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, tips on achieving a smooth a smooth long roll and then on measures 73 to 75 and 81 to 84 tips Great. on achieving a smooth long roll yeah I'll, I'll take you through it i'll take you through it i'll do the short version okay um two things you want to work on first you want to work on your soft roll i'm going to turn the camera down here so you can see the sticks all right, I have some exercises for that. Again, I'll plug my, my ensemble block videos, the snare drum fundamentals videos that I put on ensemble block where I walk through this exercise. But I'll walk it through you right now uh, very quickly. What you want to do is practice. Sir, yes. Really quick, sir, if you could share those uh, links with me. And then uh, once we're done with the stream, guys, look in the comments and I'll put them there. You can share them with me once we're done, sir, after the stream. And then, okay. guys, I will put all the links to all his uh, uh, to his channels and to everything that he's sharing with us. So you can just click and go straight to it. Yes. Sorry, sir. Yeah, I will do that. All right. So I'm going to walk you through two exercises that you should develop to, to be able to play your, your role. Or it's two, two exercises, two concepts. The first is the soft roll. All right. 50 beats per minute. What I'm doing here is I'm I'm playing quarter notes at 50 beats per minute. And sometimes I'll turn off the snare so I can really hear. What I'm trying to do is each buzz, I'm trying to make it as long as possible. And I'm trying to overlap those buzzes. So what I mean by that is while the right hand is buzzing, it stays on the head while the left hand buzzes. All right? And as you... As you go through this, you want to attack, uh, match the attack, texture, and duration of each buzz. I'm using I'm using a, a, an open fulcrum to be able to do this, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go through that necessarily because everybody will have a little bit different opinion on this. But I'm using my middle finger primarily to control the length of the buzz. And I'm trying to play that as soft as I can. So I start with quarter notes. And then I go to quarter note triplets. Then eighth notes. Triplets. And each step of the way, I'm trying to overlap the buzzes and make sure they're the same. I'm using my arm. Also, you'll notice I'm using my arm to do that. I'm not, I'm not doing this with my wrist. I'm using my arm to play the strokes. Okay. And I've opened the angle up a little bit for that, what we talked about earlier. Okay, what was on? Triplets, sixteenths, sixes, and then 30 seconds. Now, by the time you get to 30 seconds, guess what? You're playing your soft roll, all right? And that will help you to get a really smooth soft roll. Now, how do we get the loud roll? The loud roll, I use a, an exercise um, where, I, where I make use of triple stroke, okay? And the reason for that, a couple, couple of reasons that I use this technique. Number one, a triple stroke will allow the drum to breathe, and it'll be louder. Um, it'll sound smoother once it gets up to tempo, but it, most of all, it lets the drum breathe. The other thing that I do is I, I strike the drum a little bit, I don't know, maybe it's like halfway between the edge and the center, or maybe a little less, and I use it. There's a glancing stroke that happens, and so those three strokes, it strikes here, and then moves toward the center. 
like that. And I'm not trying to stroke it out. Again, I'm really only using my middle finger. I've got my fulcrum in place and my middle finger. I'm not using these other two fingers. I know some, some directors out there are like, you know, you're going to be struck by lightning if your pinky comes off the stick. It, it won't happen. In fact, your roll might sound better if those two fingers are not, are not actually on the stick. Because the stick can vibrate more freely. Okay, so this exercise, 120, and the key to this one is what's been called the chicken wing, right? I, I saw Ted Atkatz, who, was, who used to play in the Chicago Symphony, uh, do a clinic about this, and that's where I, that's where I kind of learned this. I got this. Uh, and then I, I, I studied a little bit with, um, no, it was a clinic with Doug Howard at, uh, at UNT when I was there, and he did the same thing. But this is the motion of the arms, right? So this, this elbow motion here is really important. Okay, it works like this. So I'm, uh, here, I'm going to do this on the pad so I can talk over it. I'm playing very strongly here. I'm trying to use my, my elbow a little bit, my shoulder rotation here, to get that to happen. And then I'm just letting it bounce. Quarter note triplets, eighth notes, every step of the way, still triple strokes, triplets, and then sixteenth notes. Now, by the time you get there, you're playing your loud roll. You can also try it with one hand. You, I don't know if you can hear that clearly on there, but it's just three strokes. Now you can start to see that you can start to see that chicken wing motion in there. Okay, if I take that, turn my snares on and do that. I've got a really big full snare drum roll. Now the trick is connecting the soft to the loud. And the way to do that is just practicing that a lot. Practice getting your soft roll developed, getting your loud roll developed and then play an exercise where you connect them. So start out slow, as soft as you can, and then crescendo up a little bit, and go back down. And then come up a little bit more, go back down, so forth and so on. at it, you can try doing stair steps. Like that, where you kind of drop the roll up and down. Great question. Um, okay, good. Can't, I can't hear you. I apologize. Uh, that seems to be all as far as questions are concerned for right now. I guess you can jump to the other uh, uh, instrument, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, I yeah. I don't feel like playing through the etude is absolutely necessary since my video, my reference videos are available uh, easily. I think what you're doing is great, sir. Your spot, you're hitting the the the, the spots. Uh, uh, I think this, in combination with your videos, the, uh, again, we are going to be linking them in the comments, uh, guys. So come back maybe by 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 tonight for sure in the comments. You're going to see them, and and you can you can you know have your your discussion that he's going on right now through, and then you can you know cross reference with his uh, performance, and you also have uh, videos with explanations. Correct, sir. Yes, I have tutorial videos on innovative and also phrase-by-phrase uh, -phrase breakdowns on ensemble blocks. Beautiful. Phrase-by-phrase uh, -phrase breakdowns of these day twos. That's yeah. beautiful. Leave you to it. Okay. So we're going to take a look at the timpani etude next. And um, I wanted to show you this little trick. Um, you can turn your timpani into a practice pad by just taking a towel and throwing it on the drum. And when you do that, 
mutes the head, saves your ears a little bit, but it also provides you a really great practice pad, timpani practice pad. Uh, so I do that all the time. And again, on Ensemble Block, I have a what, what I'm calling, what they're calling Evergreen Prep Timpani Foundations, uh, where I walk through all of my uh, timpani, some basic warm-up exercises, and how to approach grip and stroke. Um, I think everybody, every timpanist that I've ever seen approaches the instruments a little bit differently. My timpani playing is influenced mostly by Christopher Dean, who I studied with at UNT. And um, he used a, a technique, he used a few different techniques. It was kind of a amalgam of different ones, but essentially in a, a, a quote unquote American style grip, it was really a, a New York style, uh, Saul Goodman style, where the, the grip is in the front of the hand. So you'll notice sometimes on my video, somebody said something about my pinkies out or something. Actually, yes, that's, that's exactly right. Saul Goodman would say that the, the pinkies have a, a, a limiting effect on the timpani mallet. Um, and so, so he did not play with any uh, pinkies. And then you had somebody like, uh, you know, timpanists are really big about lineage. So then you'd have like Cloy Duff com comes in and says, well, you know, we're playing timpani, not drinking tea. You've got to have your pinky on the stick. So everybody, uh, everybody approaches it a little bit differently. Here's the main things that's important about timpani playing. First and foremost is when you're playing loud, play a legato or rebounded or lifted, however you want to think of it, stroke, not a downstroke. If you play a downstroke on timpani, you are distorting the sound of the head. Uh, the pitch will go up and it will sound really ugly. So I, I'm a big proponent of playing with good tone on timpani. The best way to, uh, to establish that is, is learning to play with this legato lifted stroke. So I always start timpani uh, when I'm teaching students, start lessons, or when I practice myself with some nice legato strokes like this. I'll do some wrist exercises. Ah, this is an important concept for you. If you're, uh, if you're wanting to play a more tympanistic technique, the, the technique is to have your thumbs up. Some people play match grip, and that's totally fine. You can still play a beautiful lifted stroke with match grip. That's fine. But I, I prefer to play in a more tympanistic uh, grip with my thumbs up. And one of the things that you want to look for here and realize is that the timpani stroke is a rotation of these two bones here, the, what is it? The ra radius ul ulna bones, right? It's this, right? Maybe a little bit of arm in there is okay, but it's really a rotation stroke. So a good way to figure this out is to, is to get in this position as if you were, was there a door down the middle and your hands here and rotate. And that will get you in the right position to play a nice legato stroke. Then wrist exercises where I spread my hands out a little bit and I just work on my wrist. What I'm looking for there is for the, the stick to come straight up and down and then some finger exercises. Now, even though I don't sometimes use my back finger, my back, uh, pinky on the stick, I do use it for playing rolls. So I wanna have a finger, some finger exercises. those fingers in shape. Um, anyway, I don't want to get too much into that, but I did want to just say briefly that that's the most important thing, lifted legato strokes. Now, when you play soft in and, and this piece in the beginning, it's perfectly fine to play down into the drums. In fact, that's a way that you're, you're going to get a little more clarity, okay? But when you play loud, a legato lifted stroke. A good example of this of when, how, how we should do this, is over at measure 29. There's a forte piano roll here, it's on E flat. Um, all right, so this forte piano roll, uh, the way I do it is strike with a legato stroke, right, lifted legato stroke, and then come underneath for the roll and crescendo out, rather than bang, playing like that. So this is a great way to apply this, this concept. Strike with a rebounded stroke, come underneath for the roll. Looks like this. Okay. Something like that. Uh, 
There is one little, I, I forgot to mention the errata on the snare drum etude. Um, it's, it's all printed there. There were just some minor tweaks to it. And this one, there's really nothing except for the very end. It's got a, a tuning change misprint. It should be E natural, GC and E natural at measure 35. So just make sure you take note of that. It's not E flat at the end, it's E natural. So make sure you check for that. Um, I think the biggest thing in this one uh, is uh, the tuning. And, and we'll talk about, we can talk about tuning and uh, how, to, how to strategize those quick tuning changes. Oh, I'll tell you too about the mallets. I'm using an innovative BT6 mallet here. What you're looking for with your mallet selection is you want to have an articulate mallet that's not harsh, all right? But you want to have a mallet that will speak clearly at the soft dynamic levels, like at the beginning. But it's not going to be overly harsh when you have to play loud. You want it to be articulate, but not harsh, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about tuning. Playing seated. I've got a timpani thrown here, I think is the way to go, all right? Because when you play seated, you can put both feet up on the pedals. I know you can't see my feet right now, but I've got both feet up on my pedals. If I'm standing, I can, I can only put one foot up at a time. So seat, seated is really the way to go. Um, when you're determining the height of your timpani throne, you want to be in a position where when you, when you bring your hands down, your, your wrists your, arm, your wrists are slightly above the rim of the drum. If you're sitting too low, uh, you know, you bring your hands down, you're gonna get, you're gonna get that. So, and if you're sitting too high, then you're gonna have this downward angle. So you wanna sit in a position where your mallet is pretty much straight across to the drum. It's not gonna be too low, it's not gonna be too high. So find that Goldilocks uh, principle at work there. The playing zone is about four or so inches in, another important concept. Okay, now let's talk about tuning specifically these quick tuning changes. Here's measure seven and measure eight. The way I do it is I articulate the pedal changes on specific beats. Try to get my timer here. Yeah, I articulate the pedal changes on specific beats. So I'll play it for you and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so on beat, uh, give it a second. On beats one and two of measure eight, that's when I articulate the pedal changes. So I have very specific timing for when they change. At the next one, measure uh, I'll play measure 14, and then I'll do the tuning changes at 15 and 16. Same concept here. I'll dampen on the rest, and then I tune on specific beats. One, and two, and three, and one. And two and three. All right. So um, same, same, same concept there. I tuned the wrong pitches actually, uh, but that is the that is the idea. Let me do that one again, so I don't embarrass myself. All right, here we go. Try that one again. One and two and three and one and two and three. brings us to the, uh, the next pitch set and it brings us to the other th thing to consider with this etude is the, these time changes. Now this is pretty easy to figure out. Uh, the, the pitch is this, uh, sorry, the uh, pulse is the same, uh, that 69 beats per minute. So that pulse now becomes the half note. So if you're practicing with your metronome, you don't have to change it. It just stays there. Then for the next one, um, when it transfers back to where the half note becomes the dotted quarter at measure 20, same concept. If this is the half note. Measure 19. Now you're already feeling the triplet. And then you're into measure 20. Ba -da -da -ba -ba. Piece of cake. Now, the tricky one, though, is coming up at measure 25. Here, it's a completely new tempo, unrelated. The closest thing is that it's almost the quarter note triplet at the previous tempo. So if you're playing, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, that's a little slower than 112 if you're doing it strictly 
with the metronome. But that will get you in the ballpark. But the main thing that you're going to want to do is set your metronome to 112 here and learn that last section until you can just feel 112. And then organically, you'll just have to start at that tempo. But that whole quarter note triplet thing, that's a good kind of cheater way to get close to it um, in your practice. But I think repetition is the way to go for that. Uh, let's see. You'll also notice there, there are two techniques that are used in this one a lot are crossover strokes. And then I do some special things on my roll, which we could talk about if you want. But crossover strokes are really important. And it's important to figure out where they are. Okay. I've got all of mine marked with, uh, with circles in my score. So I, I know where my crossover strokes are. And I've changed a number of the stickings to, uh, to, to favor right crossover because I'm more comfortable and more consistent with right crossovers. One of the things to make sure of is that you're playing evenly and you're not accenting or, or playing a bad sound with your crossover strokes. A good example is in measure 13. Let me get the pitches here. that one. But you have to be careful not to overplay uh, drum three there on that one. Another one that I changed is down here uh, at measure 38, 39. I changed my, uh, my sticking to favor my right hand. So here, let's see. This is uh, starting from 37. There I change it. It's printed as to start with the left hand, but I start with my right hand on the e, uh, one E and uh, of measure 39. There. Okay. Um, I'll say one thing about rolls real quickly, which is if you want your rolls to sound smoother, widen the hands. Okay. Especially when you're playing loud. If you're playing soft, you can play with your hands together. But if you're playing loud, spread your hands out. And one of the things I worked on a lot with Christopher Dean is shaping my roles using that kind of idea. The main, the most important thing is that you're not, you know, not moving straight out, but you're moving along that curve, all right, of the of the proper playing zone. So I use that, for instance, in measure three. So I, I start the roll here, but then as I crescendo. Okay, are there any questions on the timpani A2? Anything so far? Anybody have anything? Can't hear you, Gil, sorry. If we give him a few seconds, maybe the, some questions will come in the way they did earlier, and if not, we will move on. Okay, great. Any timpani questions, guys? Any timpani questions, uh, man, sir? Your, your tips are right on point. Beautiful okay. stuff. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. I I'm getting some text. And, you know, I love playing timpani and it's easy to like geek out on it for, yes. you know, and talk about all the different, you know, timpanists are really big on lineage and, and like who studied with who. And, you know, it's like your family, your family tree of, of percussion. is And it's really important because every great timpanist had like a completely different approach, you know. So like yes. Saul Goodman was all, you know, front of the hand. Um, yes. Hinger yes. was all back of the hand. Everything happened yes. back there, you know. Yes. So I, I use that too. I mean, um, I tell my students sometimes that there's like three ways to strike any object. You can, you can play down into it, you can rebound, and you can lift. And, and yes. timpani, because the heads are so big, it really makes a difference as to what way you're striking the drum. So, like, I can geek out on this timpani technique stuff, uh, you know, all day long. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and you know what, sir? I've, I've learned, I guess, throughout doing the streams and, and watching many, many different amazing uh, timpanists, right, and, and instrumentalists, 
I use a combination of everything that you just said. Like my kids, the general one is I, I do go to the to the to the cloid dove where all the hand is on it, right? And, and and getting a warm sound. But sometimes for certain passages, they'll do this. Sometimes they'll do this and go to the back grip, back grip. Sometimes I'll ask them to touch more or squeeze. It's a combination of A through Z. Uh, yeah. I've personally found uh, that it just enhances the etude, uh, the performance of the student. Some of them just came in, sir. How would you practice timpani tuning changes? How would you practice those segments? Yeah, um, great question. What One thing I recommend to do is you, you want to get these you want to get these pitches in your ear. So I always recommend to my students when they're playing etudes, especially etudes like this that are quite technical with have a lot of tuning changes, is to play the etude on the marimba, on a keyboard instrument or at the piano to get those pitches in your ear, all right? Um, you might have drums that have gauges, you might not. These drums have gauges and, and I've worked with setting the gauges beforehand but I also want to work on my ear. So you'll notice that when I do when I do those tuning changes, for instance, that one at measure seven and measure eight. So I'll play it again. One. I actually flick the drum with my finger to get the pitch. So I'm hearing and I'm using my gauges to gauge it. All right. But I'm really using my ears to make sure that I get the right pitches. And then if you're, if you're doing that, all right, and just practice tuning, just practice tuning. You know, what I always tell my students is like, it's a skill just like anything else. You got to practice it. So just practice that, those two measures over and over and over, or even just put on the metronome and practice two, three. Just practice tuning those two pitches and hearing the drums arrive at those pitches okay that is really important and uh back to what i was saying before make sure that because this one keeping time and the rest is really important so do the pedaling on specific beats all right so to recap practice it on marimba get those pitches in your ear to where you can sing it so even if you don't have gauges you can hear the pitches and know where they are get your head down close when you tune you can either use your stick to tune or use your fingers. I use my fingers for this etude. All right. When you're making those tuning changes and, um, and then, yeah, articulate the changes on the beat will help you stay in time. Any other questions? I think repetition of practicing the tuning changes over and over and over and getting it, it's just as vital of part of playing the instrument as playing the instrument, getting your feet, you know, sitting will help too. I mentioned that Have, playing from a seated on a throne makes a huge difference for this etude. I'm not sure. I'm sure you can do it standing up, but it would be a lot harder. Yes, yes, yes. We do have another question, sir. Uh, I, I really like this one. Uh, Gilbert Garcia, he's asking, what physical changes do you do with your hands when rolling versus playing uh, normal strokes on timpani? I guess you're playing, you know, some rhythms and then going into a roll. You know, how do you address that? Uh, That's a great and, question. And that, yes. I agree. Great. So um, rolls are a combination. You're moving between wrist and fingers. Okay. Um, so how it changes for me is I would say like largely when I'm playing, maybe 85% of the time, I'm, I'm thinking I, I'm in this sort of Goodman school of I'm thinking about the grip in the front of my hand. But when I'm rolling... I'll also want to bring in these back fingers to help, especially if I'm having to roll fast. So um, the roll speed is kind of an expressive element of your playing. The speed of the roll makes a certain feel. So, but how my hands change is I'm definitely, I'm definitely supporting a lot more with my back fingers when I play rolls. I'm using a lot more fingers. And uh, as I play louder, I'm using more arms. So if I'm going to play a really loud role, I won't, I won't do it because it'll distort the audio for, for a second, but so I can talk, I'll do this motion. And what I'm doing there is I'm, I'm squeezing with my fulcrum with those three fingers 
and I'm pumping my arms, and that will produce a really strong, powerful, loud roll. Okay, I'll show you in a second. All right? When I play soft, I'm pretty much just using my fingers only. When I'm playing, say, mezzo forte to forte, I'm primarily using wrist with support of the fingers. So soft, just fingers. Wrist. When it gets really loud, hopefully you can hear me. When it gets really loud, it's arm and fulcrum. All right? So it's a combination of all three of those things. On, on, on that note, sir, I have a question. When you incorporate your arm, are you following through with the wrist or are you just letting your wrists flop with the arm motion um, doing the, the main primary motivation? It's a good question. Um, basically, what I'm doing is I, I want, I, I want the, the force of the stroke to, to, to hit very sharply against the drum and not stay there. I want the transference, okay? So what I'm doing is almost like, almost like you know that rubber pencil thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's almost like that. Only, only I'm holding much firmer, right? So I'm just using oh. my arm and I'm pulling the stick back, like like that. I'll show you a demonstration that Christopher Dean showed, and um, this is a really great demonstration of why this why this is good. So let me get over here. I saw him do this one time in a clinic, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to show you how this works. If I take this music stand, hopefully you can see this. Maybe I'll take it back here. Yeah, we have a clear view right there, sir. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see clearly. Okay. So if I, if I throw this towel at the music stand... Come over here a little bit. If I throw this towel at the music stand like this, watch what happens. You know, if I did it hard enough, I can I can knock over the stand. Now, that would be equivalent of doing this, right? Leaving the stick in the head, and it distorts the sound of the head. But instead, what I want to do is this. Ah, here it goes. A metal stand works better, and it, you get that ping. It goes ping, and all of the sound is coming from the from the lift motion, not from from that. All right, it doesn't work great with the plastic stand, but that's basically what he showed me, and it wow. made a lot of sense because the transference of energy goes right into the head if you're playing if you're playing down in the drums. You're letting the stick have more contact with the head. If you can get the, the stick away from the drum, it's like popping yes. it out. You'll get, you'll get all the power and resonance. Yes. It'll vibrate the head, but it won't distort the head. Yes, because you're it, it's coming off. It's not you know messing with the vibrations, and it's just just thinking of it in the you know in, in my head theoretically, it makes for a very powerful and smooth roll. Exactly, and also I mean it's also the reasoning behind. Uh, why not to play downstrokes on the timpani? Because yes. that makes the head distort, whereas a lifted stroke just vibrates the whole head. The whole head is vibrating rather than yes. that. Yes. Yeah. So you're you're pinching with with the front uh, grip, and the back fingers are not engaged at that point. Am I correct? Right. Yep. It's just this. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now that's that's for like. Really aggressive, loud, you know, triple yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Tchaikovsky or something, you know. Uh, maybe, maybe at the end of this one at measure forty, you have triple F. You might be able to do that there. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Right there on those last couple of rolls. Yes. Yeah. We have a comment giving you props. Vital information by. Trini, Trini Lopez, awesome. Uh, that seems to be all the questions uh, for for now, sir. Uh, okay. We can go to mallets. All right. 
Again, while he does the the, the change, uh, guys, please keep your questions coming in. Uh, if you notice, you know, uh, every single question uh, that you, you know, for those that have been participating with questions, every single one of your questions has been addressed. Uh, that's the whole thing about this stream, guys. It, it would be no of no benefit for him to just regurgitate the, the exact same information he did at TBA, right? It, it, it would be pointless. Now, uh, we've had a week or so with the etudes. We've been able to study them. We've been able to see recordings. We've been able to have our kids play them. And now, you know, we're starting to see the different obstacles and, and pitfalls that our students personally are having which may be different from the neighboring district, from the districts all across the state of Texas. And, you know, by adding your questions, you're customizing this clinic to you. That's the whole purpose of this, guys. So please, please, please ask your questions. I'll leave you to it. Okay. So we're going to take a look at the two mail now. Sorry, let me get my timer. Um, we're going to look at the two mallet first. Uh, this piece, uh, Presto from Concerto in A minor by Vivaldi, it comes from the Baroque era. And what that tells me is that I want to be expressive, but not overly dramatic. Uh, I'm going to maintain a steady tempo throughout. I'm going to find the longer lines. I'm going to find the phrases and the contours and play those within the given dynamic level, often alternating between forte and piano. And uh, the, you'll, you'll notice that there's no phrase markings in the piece. So you're going to have to use that. One of the things that I use is just follow the direction of the line. If the line goes up, you could crescendo slightly. If the line goes down, you could diminuo, diminuendo, or, or you could do the opposite. But you'll have to find those. They're, they're not written in there. Uh, you can use my reference recordings to help you figure out that and, and see what my interpretation is. You might make different choices. That's okay as long as you're staying within the dynamic level to do that. It's important, this is kind of an important concept, the, the concept of the dynamic as a range. We often think, because maybe because of marching percussion, I, I don't know, but sometimes we think of dynamics like a set height or a set, you know, sound. But a dynamic is not that. A dynamic is a range because where do you, where, you know, where's the dividing line between mezzo forte and forte? Yeah, at what point does it become forte? At, at what point does it stop becoming forte and become mezzo forte? And then, and then on the other end, at what point is for, forte now fortissimo? So that means that dynamics, by their very nature, have to have a range. So don't feel that you have to play flat. Uh, you should never really play music flatly. It should always be uh, expressive and, and moving. Mallet selection is really important for this piece. I'm using the IP300. The reason I chose this stick is because of the evenness of color throughout the dynamic spectrum. This one has a rubber core, and it sounds the same coloristically whether I'm playing soft or loud. It has the same color. It doesn't change. It doesn't become harsher at the loud dynamic level. And I think that's a really important uh, trait for mallets for this piece. Um, so that's why I'm choosing these mallets. Some technical considerations for playing two mallets. Obviously, keep your hands low at all times. You're going to want to have some warm-ups, some exercises, some scalar things that you can practice. Uh, this piece has a lot of scalar and arpeggiated passages. Practice those. Get some exercises together that you can practice keeping your hands low and being uh, moving with good efficiency on the instrument. Um, but especially during these, you know, these scalar passages and these arpeggiated passages, like I think that's at 70, uh, 75. Uh, those you're going to want to really keep your hands low. Now you'll also notice that I choke up quite a bit on my stick. There's a reason for that. Uh, first of all, it puts the target, what I'm trying to hit, closer to my hand. So I can be more accurate that way. The second thing that you might not know is that these mallets were, of course, designed to be held in this grip or be held with a four mallet grip so that you have ease, you can easily reach an octave or even a tenth by holding with, with four mallets. But when you play two mallets, that puts the target really far away from your hand. So I like to choke up quite a bit on the stick, puts the target closer to my hand, and those mallets are not really designed to be two mallets, they're designed to be for four mallets. So that's, that's a, another tip for you. Um, sometimes I'm playing on the edge of the bar for this piece, especially in that, that passage 
uh, that really difficult passage there. At, uh, it's measure 75 where it starts, this one. I would tell you that, boy, uh, that is a tough passage. There's a couple of uh, things in here that I would recommend that when, you, when you're getting started here right at the beginning, don't try to play these things too fast. You know, when I started learning it, I was nice and slow, okay? Um, really deciding your bar placement. Really think of it like, um, I tell my students sometimes when they start a piece, to treat it like a block of granite. Just play it, play the notes, you know, play it flat at first so that you can hear you can hear the tonality of it. You can hear the phrasing and then and play it slow. And then as you get going with it, you'll, you'll decide, okay, here's my bar placement. Because if you're moving slow, you can figure that things, you can figure those things out. Here's my sticking, here's my bar placement. Then you get to where you hear the phrasing. Then you can start experimenting with shaping or using a gogic pulse. I do use a gogic pulse in this peak quite a bit to keep it nice and light. Um, I think that's really important, especially in passages like at 75. I'm emphasizing the top note. And even, even creating a shape within those phrases, even though it's, it's soft. All right? So, uh, pra but practicing slow is going to be absolutely key to getting, to getting this to happen. Another one, another place to really practice slow are these figures over at measure 35, uh, 33 and 35. Practice that super, super slow. Um, I'll, I'll let you in on a, one, one way that I break these things down. And I learned this from, uh, from the great orchestral players uh, that, that do this. And what they do is they'll practice like when they're practicing Porgy and Bess. You've, maybe you've heard of that. Right? That, that excerpt, real famous orchestral excerpt. I know people that can play just the right hand of Porgy and Bess. And it's always amazing to, to figure out, you know, how, how to do that. So for this one, there's a couple of licks. Uh, the first one that I did this on was, let's see, where is it? Uh, measure 83 and 84. It's just this little C major. But playing that at tempo is really difficult to be accurate. So here's how you can break that one down. Take your, uh, let's do it, start with the right. Take your left stick and turn it around and just focus on what the right hand plays. See what notes that right hand plays and clue into that almost like a check pattern. And then once you've done that a few times, repeat it as you need to until you can just focus in on that right hand. And then you can just practice the right hand. And that makes you a thousand times more accurate on that lick. Uh, it's how I, you know, it's how I maintained it all this, all this time. The other thing, and then of course, practice what the left hand plays. Right? And once you do that, you're going to be much more accurate. Um, you can do that also on the, the licks at 33. Take just the right hand. You know, and figure out what the right hand does, figure out what the left hand does. That's a great way to break these things down, especially for those difficult passages. Um, let's see. One of the things, one, a good tip for you is uh, some sticking things and a couple of musical ideas. When you get to this figure at measure 15, hey, there's some double strokes there at 16 and 18. And whenever that figure comes up, it's going to be a double stroke. But you'll notice this. When I have repeated notes, I, I lean on them. I put some direction in them. Right? So it's this, it's this rule to never play anything flat. You don't want to play... That's, that's not musical, that's boring, so. And then there, back off. So you think about leaning forward and leaning back. Every time that comes up.
Here, a gadget pulse helps keep it buoyant. Keeps it, I like to say buoyant, I use that word a lot. Keeps it kind of bouncy and not, not heavy. Now here, you've got these Swartzando. What I do there is just to differentiate it from the other accents, I just play a little bit longer of an accent. So it's the accents a couple more strokes than I normally would. Uh, yeah, that Gogic Pulse helps keep it light. Another place that I use a Gogic Pulse is over here at measure 37. There's a long passage here. So I, that's a long phrase. Now, I, I was able to find the long line there from all the way from here to here, uh, where, wherever the last one is. I think it's trying to eat. All right, so I drew a line from there to there. Um, another play, and then in measure 45, I'm actually phrasing up to the A. Like that. Even though there's no accent written there, I just felt like that shape was really a good place. And it's uh, using that agogic pulse to keep it buoyant, shaping, etc. I'll show you one more thing, which I think is important to go over. It's a tiny little just moment here, and that is at, uh, at the bar before B, you've got this little trill. Now, it looks like it's tied, but it's, it's actually lifted. You want that D sharp to sound. That's the note you're emphasizing with the trill. You want to start the trill in the E. So in slow motion, that measure goes... Okay, and I put both the 16th note on the right hand, uh, pickups to B. At tempo, it's just this little passing thing. But remember to start the trill in the upper note and leave the note that's being trilled, the D sharp, as the last note, and then you re-articulate the E. Like that. Okay, um, what questions do you have? Thank you for the comments, Joseph. I appreciate that. Any other questions or things that I can share with you about this etude? And Gil, your microphone. Third time's a charm. That's the third time you call me on it, sir. I apologize. <laughs> okay, uh, sir, uh, let's give them a few seconds. Uh, uh, I'm sure I, it, it seems like they, they've picked up on that, and I, I think we're going to start seeing them again. Uh, sir, uh, um, uh, when it comes to note accuracy, I know that uh, uh, by experience, that is a huge factor. And uh, from a musician point of view, it bothers me because, you know, uh, why are you going to uh, score a kit lower? because he or she missed one or two notes you know uh versus a kid that doesn't miss any notes and maybe the one that missed a few notes um played it more musical right more more pleasing but unfortunately it has been i it has been the case that the kid that misses no notes is the one that scores higher it's 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 a it's somehow written you know permanently in the judging panel's mind somehow right uh, uh, um, and in the universe somehow so what other uh, suggestions might you have uh, in regards to note accuracy in general? I, I guess, yeah, uh, the arpeggiated stuff is the, 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 the toughest, right? But then sometimes some scale runs are also tough. Uh, what would you uh, suggest, sir? Well, um, first of all, working on your note accuracy happens when you practice slow. You're training your body, uh, you're training muscle memory, kinesthetic memory, when you practice slow. Um, some people are, are proponents of, of doing that, practicing slow, breaking things down. I mentioned, you know, focusing on one hand, like in that one, in those couple of licks. Uh, that's a way to, that's a way that orchestral players who are also, you know, judged on their note accuracy when you go in to do a professional audition, you know, you can't miss any notes. That's just part of the gig. You can't miss notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in, in performance, that's a different thing. When you go in for a performance, uh, you know, sometimes something goes sideways or something, but for an audition or from a real critical kind of thing like this, yeah, note accuracy is important. 
Um, I agree with you personally. I, I feel that uh, I feel like it needs to be a package deal, right? I don't yes. want somebody who plays like a robot. I want I want a musician. You know, that's that's who I want. In my band is yes. somebody who can spin a phrase and, and knows how to breathe and and play. You know, play music. That's what this is all about. So I, I'm not a bean counter in terms of that. Um, I understand that it's important in the um, t- you have to have something to be able to separate. In a, comp- in a competition setting, you know, player A from player B. Okay, well, that person mm-hmm. didn't miss any notes. So, you know, how you quantify that. But for me, that's something that if I'm a player, I can't control that. So what I want to do, what I want to encourage students to do is just play to the very best of their ability and know how to work on note accuracy. And if that happens for you on that day, then great. You know, you played it note perfect, super even better is if you had a good musical experience with it. That that's really the yes. key. And then everything else is kind of out of our control. You yeah, know, I guess what I would exactly. say to educators out there is to to keep in mind the the purpose of what we're trying to do here is teach music and playing yes. like a robot and just playing all the notes in the right order, that's not music really. So I exactly. think as long as if we keep that in mind and keep our, our heads on straight about like what, what we value in music and we translate that to our students, hopefully we can strike a balance between, you know, playing robotically and playing, you know, somebody's going to come in and play all the right notes and they're going to play musically and beautifully. And that's great. That's yes. stars aligned and it's perfect. This is one yes. of those pieces where I, I would be hard pressed to find somebody who will consistently play it and not miss any notes. Yes. Uh, it's yes. Really difficult. All right. So yeah. my videos I did in one take. Um, I only had, I think one take where I didn't miss any notes and I played I it a bunch of times, you know? Um, so like for the, you know, for the video that went out to the public, that's all one take, except I think I missed one note at the end and I had to plug in the someplace at the very end. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it is almost impossible to play this piece uh, and and not have a note that goes sideways because it's fast and yeah. there's a lot of notes in it. So yeah. I, I think, you know, I think there's places where you absolutely let me answer this. Uh, let me answer this question strategically. All right. Yes. There are yes. Places, please. There are places where I think you can miss notes and nobody's even going to hear it. And there's yes. places where you can miss notes and everybody's going to hear it. All right. So those couple of places, I think, are from A to B, you can't miss any notes, as you can hear it. Now, the, the, with the exception of maybe 45, 46, 47, and 48, because those... Uh, I mean, I, if I play that 10 times in a row, I'm probably missing a note at least one or two times out of 10, you know? Yes, uh, yes. But there's, there's, you know, that's a place where maybe it's going by so quickly you, you wouldn't hear it. And if you're shaping it in a way to de-emphasize that. But I think from A to B, it's real important to hit all the right notes, obviously. Yes, um, yes. The other place that it's really hard is in that, that arpeggiated section. You know, that, that's just really hard section to play accurately. Um, one of the things that I did with that one again is practice the, the single hand. And the hardest one is moving from this to that one because that's a oh, big, yeah, that long skip. Yeah, it's a, it's a really long skip right there. So yeah, anyway, I see. I see. I think, I think we work on those things, right? We, we don't want to miss notes. So Work on your accuracy by practicing slow, separating the hands, do all the work. But at the end of the day, like if you miss a note in performance, I mean, everybody misses notes, right? Yeah. Yo-Yo Ma yeah. misses notes when he plays the cello. I've seen Keiko Abe play a bunch of times. She always misses notes. Do I yeah. enjoy yeah. it less? No. No. They're master, you know, they're master musicians. So it, who cares, you know? Now, if you're missing notes every other bar and you, you know, uh, if you've got that's other a different bars, story. That's, but one note here or there, you know. It's the garlic in the sauce. It's what makes the plate taste better. Yeah. I, I would take somebody well, who, who plays musically 
and rel and and accurately, but maybe not perfectly. If it, it, it just yes. it's like a, it's a sliding scale, right? So hopefully you can play accurately and musically. <laughs> yes, you, you you know, sir. Uh, it's funny that you said that because my especially in the top kits, when I happen to judge like area uh, or any any important uh, competition, the top kits, the ones that like okay, these kits are you know in in this in in about the same level. I, I, I my question is what tugged at my heart, and that's how I'll go. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have one question, sir, and I was thinking about this. I'm glad they asked for it. Um, Anthony Armstead, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, Robinson, would you suggest having students listen to a violinist since the piece was written for violin? Yes, and absolutely. And if, if I can add to that, sir, if you already have uh, certain recordings on YouTube that you like, that you can suggest? Yeah, I I, uh, I I have several. I have a whole uh, Spotify playlist that I can share with you. But um, I, I try to listen. I try to listen widely, and I'm a big believer in. Um, I'm actually a big believer in playing along with recordings as a way oh. to get as a way to get an interpretation together. Um, yes. So, for instance, you know, there's this uh, the phrasing that I do here, where I emphasize that top A. Um, I, that I picked up from a recording. I, I heard that oh, and wow. I heard a violinist do that and I liked it. And so I stole it and I said, I'm going to use that because before I was doing, you know, how was I doing it? I was emphasizing the C rather than the top mm. A. But as soon as I heard that, I said, oh, that's, that's where the phrasing goes. It goes up to there. So yeah, yes. uh, absolutely. Listen to the original. And when we get to the four mallet, the four mallet piece was originally, a, a, you know, for a guitar. And so you, one of the things that listening and modeling on another instrument is you start to brush your sensibilities as a percussionist against those sensibilities of a string player yes. or, or whatever the instrument is. So, um, you know, for instance, when I have students play, uh, play pieces like um, or play excerpts, you know, there's a great example of uh, the Bartok uh, concerto for orchestra it starts out with a snare drum solo. Boom. Da -dum. Da -da -da -dum -dum. Like, like that, right? Well, that's the phrasing. And they say, well, why, do I, why do I phrase it that way? And I said, well, listen to the bassoon that comes in next. The bassoon comes in. That's the theme that you were just playing on the snare drum, you know? Yes. So, like, so listening to that and, um, you know, but what I said about brushing sensibilities up, what are the limitations that we have as percussionists? We don't have to breathe to play, you know, yes. we can hold our breath, but breathing makes a big, that's what, you know, musicianship connected to our bodies and we don't use our breath to play this instrument, but musicianship is connected to our voice and singing. So breathing. Yes. Is yes. You know? yes. Think of the violin. Um, they can do things we can't do. They can shape notes in, in ways they can do, you know, vibrato, but they have limitations too. the length of the bow. Right. So when they're playing up high and they play with a fast bow speed, that has a different character than if they're playing a slow bow speed. Uh, all of those things are really important to think about. And so listening to recordings are absolutely important. The other thing that you're going to learn in, about this piece, if you listen to recordings, is the range of tempos. All right. This piece oh, I've heard yes, yes. at like 100 beats per minute. And I've heard recordings at 128 beats per minute. The, the piece that we have here is marked at like 126, but it could be slower. It could be faster. Um, I think the range I gave on it was, uh, what, 116 to 126. Mm -hmm. It could even go slower and be completely musically appropriate based on the yes. recordings that I heard. Uh, but yes. I, I felt like it was more challenging to give the slightly faster tempo markings for the state, yes. the state level. But you, you could certainly play it slower, and violinists do play it slower. So that's that is something yeah. to learn. But yes, thank you, yes. Uh, thank you for that. That's that's a really good that's a really good uh, thing to do. Listening Question. to these recordings. I'm sorry, I apologize, uh, sir. You know, you know one thing that I really, really uh, uh, that was new for me in what you just said. Uh, uh, I always go to recordings, right, to get the the nuance, but playing along with it that's new. That's a new concept to me. 
It's like when you're you're gonna trace a, a drawing, right? And you're developing your artist skills. Now you're tracing the nuance of yep. a virtuoso and or, yep. or a different instrument. Yep. That to me was like yeah, because beautiful. you start to you start to get inside the interpretation in that way. You know, if you can play along with it and you and, and you know, you have uh, you know, we we might approach it and have a certain idea of how it should be phrased or or how I should breathe or something but then as soon as you listen to that violinist play it they have a completely different take on it maybe they hesitate yes. a little bit here or they push forward a little bit there or they emphasize this note and i think oh wow they're getting ahead of me or or oh man they're really shaping that a lot differently than i play it and so then you listen and you make a connection there that's definitely the way to go and there's also um gil i don't know if you know this uh app let's see if i'm gonna forget the name of it but there's an app i can share with you later too where yes, you can please where you can speed up and slow down recordings. Oh, wow. It'll take two seconds to find it here. Yes, yes. What is it called? I use it a lot with drum set. Um, what is it? Ah, sure. and it so makes, I, can't find, I can't find it quickly, but I'll share it with you later. Yes, There's probably and again. App that does it, but like it'll play a recording and you can speed it up and slow it down so but but oh, without changing the pitch of it you know yeah oh okay and, yes and yes actually and actually that's a feature of ensemble block as well so if you play if you uh, use my ensemble block recording the reference recording you can slow it down and play along with nice nice yeah. nice that to me was a big one sir just that one was worth the money today <laughs> okay, uh, sir, there seems to be no more questions. I think we can go to the four mallets. Four mallet? Okay, great. Yeah. Again, guys, uh, st uh, what I'll do is once the stream is done, guys, uh, in, 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 the, in the caption, right, where, where you, that you see above the, the, the link, uh, I'm going to go in and edit, and I'm going to include all his, uh, uh, all his links that he's going to share. Hopefully, uh, that Spotify link is shareable as well. Uh, so that you can just click and there you have it. So once you go to our page, you'll have everything that you need to do to have a successful audition, guys, which is the whole purpose of this deal. Yes, I'll leave you be. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the four mallet. Um, this one uh, by Fernando Carulli on Dante. This piece was originally for guitar. And uh, I asked our guitar professor here at Sam Houston State uh, about the piece, and he showed me the original score uh, because I was, I was curious about where it came from. And it's, it's a training piece. It's sort of like a, a technical musical training piece. Uh, in the original, there are no dynamics. And in Rebecca Kite's book, there's no dynamics. So I decided that I should prescribe a set of dynamics. So those are in the errata, and you want to just make sure that you get those translated into your score. That's very important. Uh, there is a roadmap to adhere to that also I changed in the errata. So the roadmap mm -hmm. is you play from the top to the bottom and then da capo al fine, which means go back to the head. So you go all the way back to the beginning and play to the fine. That's what da capo al fine means. So when you get to the fine, I've moved it to measure nine. So when it cadences on that D minor, that's the end of the piece. All right. And that's the roadmap, uh, roadmap that you're going to follow. This piece is uh, from the Romantic era of music. And what that means to me is that now I can play very expressively, whereas the two mallet piece from the Baroque era is a different style. There, I wanted to keep the tempo really steady. I wanted to kind of temper the lines within uh, the dynamic levels very clearly. Here, the phrase markings are all clearly marked in the score. And I want to play expressively. Um, and I can also, this has made the big difference between this one and the other one and the two mallet is that I can um, push and pull with the tempo, all right? And uh, I've, got some, I've got some ideas about that and I'll share that with you in a second, but that's really important. This, this piece um, technically is not very difficult, all right? And I chose it specifically for two reasons. One, for for students who are just beginning to play four mallets, it's accessible. The techniques are not super difficult. It addresses three different stroke types. There are single uh, independent strokes. There 
there's double verticals. And you even have to navigate some of these changes of having an accidental on the outside mallet or on the inside mallet. And so that's good to work on that for double verticals. And then there is single alternating strokes, these. So um, it doesn't have any laterals. It doesn't have lateral strokes, but um, a good warm up will have all four stroke stroke types. You'll work on verticals, single independence, single alternating, and laterals. So you want to make sure that you have that so that you establish the technique that you need for this piece. We want to retain a sense of lightness from the original guitar. Again, listening to recordings, as was mentioned before, is very important. Getting a sense of the phrasing and the sound of that. The guitar is a very delicate kind of instrument. It's not super aggressive. Uh, that while this piece will be very expressive, it's not going to be super intense or in your face. It's going to be a reserved kind of piece. Um, I, my mallet selection will also help uh, in that in that uh, in the sound of it. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, I'm using the IP 502s in my left hand and 503s in the right. Uh, balance is going to be really important, and this helps to balance the voice's melody and harmony. So I have a slightly harder stick in my right hand. Slightly harder, uh, slightly softer sticks in my left hand. Now, there's no right way to to do phrasing, but the phrasing here is clearly marked. So you you already have a roadmap for how to do it. I'm going to talk about three main concepts here, and and then we'll uh, we, we can address some of your questions. The first concept is musical tension and release. What what does that mean? Music needs to have. And, and is inherently has this kind of tension and release. Now, there's several different ways that you can approach tension and release musically, but the one that I'll focus on here is to lean in on dissonances and relax on consonances. So meaning play dissonances a little bit louder, play consonances or resolutions a little bit softer. A good example of that is, I uh, should get you the exact measure number for it. A good example of that is over here at when you start to have this sighing motif at measure nine, this is a dissonance. That right there is a dissonance. Half step. That's a dissonance. So I'm leaning on that and then relaxing into that consonance. So that's a good example of musical tension and release and how to use it. Um, that kind of sighing motif happens also in the B section over here. And actually, it's worth saying the form of this piece is actually quite important. You've got a primary theme. You have uh, a primary theme in D minor and then a little development section, and then the return of that theme, or you could think of it as a secondary theme. And then it switches to the major key, where you have a new theme at measure 26 and a major key, and then a kind of return to the B theme over here at measure 34 and 35. And then it goes back, you're back in F major, and then you're back in D minor for the end of the piece. So it's worth noting that just to take note of the, the form of the piece. That's that's important. Okay, now, um, so that's tension and release. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this tempo push and pull thing. This is the hardest thing to teach. And this is where listening to music is absolutely vital. Uh, listening to music is the only way that you're going to really understand the language, the syntax of music and how to do it. So um, this is one of those things that uh, it's hard to teach, but it's easy to teach if the students are listening. And, and if you're students and you're listening to this right now, you've got to listen to music. You've got to listen to widely. Um, for this piece, you can listen to any Spanish guitar piece and get a flavor for what, for what this is like. All right, any of uh, Carulli's other pieces, the album that you find this piece on, listen to that guitarist play other things. All right, listening, listening, listening. But here's a quick way that you can approach this tempo push pull. Um, tempo 
Temple markings used to be, uh, when we think about pre-industrial age, connected to um, organic things, walking, running, horse galloping, it, uh, dancing, dance moves. Uh, so all throughout history, tempos have been connected to human movement or animal movement. All right, when we think of the horse gallop, that's a horse, that's about the speed that a horse gallops, right? You know, that William Tell overture. Um, so in this case, one of the things that I found helps is to have students walk and sing particular lines of the music. And that can help to keep the push-pull from becoming too exaggerated. So a good, a good example of this is the... Is that phrase right there. If I can walk and sing that, then I know that I'm not being too extreme, right? If I'm doing, uh, let's see, let me get my pitches. So I'm stretching a little bit on that C. And that's, again, something that I heard a guitarist do, and I liked it, so I stole it. If I do that too extremely, It doesn't work. It's not, it's sudden, suddenly something else, all right? So music either dances or it sings. This one does both. So use that to help you sing those phrases. Same thing with this one, this, this phrase. As long as you can kind of walk or pace, uh, kind of, I sway back and forth here so I don't walk out of the frame, but that's, that's key. And I've used this with students all the time, and it, it, man, it works wonders. So I would, I would encourage you, if you're going to do this tempo push-pull thing, that's what you want to do. And you want to save it for, uh, you know, like a cadential moments, like that cadence point there. That's that measure... Uh, uh, starts at measure seven and eight, where you have this. Okay. Uh, there's also a little fermata over at measure 17. Make sure you give that its proper value as well. And the last concept, musical concept here, is balance. Uh, you need to balance melody and harmony in this piece. You do that by having the graduated mallets, harder set in the right, softer set in the left. That will focus your ear, it'll focus our ear to the, to the melody. And then, I, and then I'm also balancing with my playing. I'm playing the right hand a little bit with a little bit more clarity, a little bit more uh, dynamic, uh, and playing this a little softer. Uh, and, and then when you get over here, there's a, a tough one. At measure 26, you get into this B section. You have this. in mallet four. So that mallet needs to be brought out of the texture a little bit more. This mallet, mallet two, has the harmony and mallet number three has a pedal tone. That C goes all the way through there. So you want to balance those three voices. Also, you'll notice the phrasing there, right? As the line ascends, It's a little bit louder, All right? So finding that, again, remember we talked about range of dynamic. So where does the forte become mezzo forte? That's the range that I'm working with there. All right? Okay, those are my concepts. Uh, I'm happy to hear any questions that you have, and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, and Gil, I can't hear you one more time, sorry. This is by Anthony Robinson. I have listened to a couple of students play through the four mallet etude and they are having problems with playing the dull stops without playing flams or grace notes. What are your suggestions to remedy this? Or are the non-flat stops not that crucial? 
Um, I think that um, I think that the the I think that the double stops should that, that both pitches should sound at the same time, and that's that's a good technique to be able to to work on. Um, probably part of the challenge is I'm guessing for students is that the having to deal with an accidental on the outside mallet or or an accident on the inside mallet because we have right there. I would I would guess that's probably an area where you might be getting that. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. a, a good way to address that to make sure that we're uh, that we're playing true double stops all the way through here is of course to isolate, but also to have a technical exercise that address this. All right, so I'll show you the exercise that I use. I use a couple of different ones when I when I warm up for this piece. I'll often do this exercise. I'll play thirds as double stops. And I'll go ahead and play with both hands. You could just do one hand at a time if you really want to focus in. I do both hands and I practice moving in, in, in thirds all the way up the keyboard. And what this does is it puts my, my body in all those positions. Now, what you're going to want to watch for here is when you've got an accidental on the outside mount. Okay, this this will really help students, I think, get this together. All right? The positioning of the hand is really important. A lot of students want to do this. They want to like raise their elbow up to get in this position, but it's really about wrist curvature. So if you can get the so for an accidental on the outside mallet, wrist curvature decreases. And then if they're playing from the wrist and they're in this position, it should be a double stop and, and not or, or. Right? So we want. So you can practice that. Maybe just one hand at a time. Would be the best thing and then I, I forgot to mention this so then when you have an accidental on the inside mallet wrist curvature and what I'm talking about is this wrist curvature right here increases so I go from this flat position to a more increased wrist curvature and then again using my wrist to play so part of it is just getting your body in those different positions uh, and there's nothing better than an exercise like like what I played, where you're just playing major thirds all the way up the keyboard to put yourself in that position. You can also do it with uh, just playing the major chord, and this you know this works on shifting as well. So you play in first position or home position, and then inversions, and that works on shifting shifting the intervals as well as this, especially when you start doing other keys. Like that. So I think that as part of a regular warm-up routine will really help students get more comfortable. And I think you'll find if, if you add that to uh, a, a warm-up routine that they'll be more consistent with the sound of their of their double stops. Any more questions, guys? Any more questions that you might have uh, before we close the stream for today? Um, Dr. Dr. Lane, this, this clinic was jam-packed with gold nuggets through and through. Uh, oh, we, ha we have somebody posting for you, Ensemble Block. Uh, let me bring it up. Amazing master class. Thank you for hosting. Oh, the Valley Percussion Festival and Professor John Lane. Can you share some things you notice immediately when you hear students perform that immediately differentiate a young musician from a more mature musician? How does this impact the way we can approach our practice? Very good question. Very yeah, me, good question. Okay, that's great. You share some things you notice immediately when you hear students perform that differentiate a young musician from a more mature musician. Okay, for me, I think um, the mark of mature musicians 
when I hear somebody come and I hear that maturity, what I'm hearing is that they understand the connection between music and the body, that, that it's organic, that the music sounds organic. Yes. And what I mean by that is that they're using their humanness, they're using their, their body, they probably sung through the music, they're, they know how to breathe and express. That, to me, is the mark of a mature musician. Um, the immature musician plays very stiffly, plays very robotically, you know. Um, so, for instance, this playing this first opening phrase, a mature musician will approach that and realize that every single note has a different weight. I didn't play one single note the same. Every note was moving towards something or moving away from something. And especially for mallets, uh, this goes the same for all the instruments, but especially here, that quality is what mature musicians do. That's what I hear when I listen to Yo-Yo Ma play the cello. He plays every single note with such care and attention to the nuance, the sound as it crescendos up or down or whatever phrase he's doing, whatever sound he's producing. All right. And it's always connected to the voice. It's always connected to the body in some way, whether that's the, the organic push and pull that I was talking about earlier or singing and breathing, physically breathing before we play is very important. Okay. And that's what a mature musician does. An immature musician comes in and plays it completely flat with no regard for balance of right and left hands or melody and harmony. There's sort of no understanding of that at all. Um, they don't know how to do that push and pull thing. They're going to try to do it too extremely. I've heard uh, that piece Virginia Tate a bunch of times at the, you know, at all state soul and ensemble contest. And inevitably, you know, they're trying to do that push and pull thing and it's just stretching like taffy, you know, it's not, not working. Uh, so, so that I think, I think those things, musical things, are really the separation. And I think that mature musician is the one who spent the most time listening to music. I think that's the key point there. Good, great question. Uh, sorry, Gil. Who, who was the one, sir, that asked this question? Because it's from Ensemble Block. Do you know? I, I, it's probably somebody from the team. It might be Huey Yuan Pan, okay. who's uh, the head of Ensemble Block. It could be him. Uh, if that's Huey, okay. thanks, Huey. Uh, yes. And uh, yes. we'll make sure and yeah, we'll make sure and get the ensemble block uh, links out to everybody so they can yes. check out that platform. It's really, really cool what they're doing. Yes. At this point, I want to say something in regards to ensemble blocks, sir. Why don't we do? And I'm saying it here in public, so it commits both of us. If 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 that's what you guys want to do, we should do a, a live stream where you talk about ensemble block, what it is, uh, and what it has to offer. And, and why we should be involved with it and using it on a daily basis. What do you say? Um, well, I think that's a really good idea. I think the person to have to talk about it too would be Huey, uh, because okay. he's really the you know he's really the mastermind of that whole thing, and uh, he's got a whole team that he works with, and um, you know he he would uh, be great to answer questions about the platform. I'm brand new to it. I, I just started with. Oh, them, okay. I uh, see. I see. For this particular project, so. Uh, I'm just, you know, what, basically he came to me this summer and asked if I would be interested in, you know, playing whenever the etudes were released, if I would be interested in maybe playing one of the etudes. And I said, well, actually, I'm the selector this year, uh, you know, so I've got all the etudes and I'm, I'm going to be ready to go with all of them. And, uh, you know, he, he said, uh, and then he showed me the platform and what they could do. And I was just completely blown away. I'm still got. I've got all kinds of ideas about what things I might develop there, but uh, the, the, it's so cool what they can do. Awesome, awesome. The, I, I, because I, 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 I'm new to Ensemble Block, pretty much. Uh, the little bit that that I've learned from you, that's all I know. I, I honestly thought you were probably like, uh, uh you were the one creating it, but it, it seems like you joined no. that group or that team. No, okay, no. good, no, it's, good, it's what awesome. Think, and uh, I just, uh, he asked me to develop some content and it, it was just like a perfect combination because I just, I happened to be the selector this year. He was asking me, you know, maybe you can play the snare drum etude or something. I was like, well, actually yeah. I'm already developing all this content for TMEA. So maybe we can work on that. And so yeah, we, yeah. we 
developed a whole a whole thing. But uh, awesome. But yeah. Well, Way, if you're listening, uh, if you want to reach out, I'm down to do that. I would love to have Ensemble Block in our streams and, and do one stream dedicated. Maybe it can be you, Way, or maybe it can be, you know, Dr. Lane or anybody that you choose so that we can, you know, uh, uh, do a whole stream of what it is that Ensemble Ensemble Block is, what it has to offer, and why we should be using it. Uh, right now, due to the Texas All-State music, it would be great to have Dr. John Lane be the one that that, that leads it. But, you know, um, um, we're open to, to anything that's a percussion educational source, uh, uh, resource. We are always down to share it and, and, and make it public to the masses. So, yes, yeah. yes. I think what would be really good is to have like a walkthrough of their of their portal and how they, you know, how you can interact with it. Because that was the thing that totally blew me away with Ensemble Blog is that you can. So it's a it's a portal where the video plays. But down below is a score that scrolls and, oh, okay. and then there's some tools with it. So you can you can click in the music below and like highlight a certain section and make a loop of it. So it just loops that section over and over and over. Um, you can oh, slow wow. it down. You can speed it up. You can go through the score and click on a measure and it scrubs to that spot in the video. I mean, oh, wow. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a really multifunctional kind of platform interactive. And it, it really, for me, what I, I could imagine is it, it kind of allows students to interface with the material in the way. Yes. They're doing it already. Everybody's got their phones and they're all into, you know, finding the music on YouTube and all of that. But this gives them a, a little bit more control with how they're interacting with it. And uh, I, I think it's just it's really it's really fantastic for learning. I, I yes. think just for education, it's really great. Yes, so it's I like having it's your a, it is a subscription service. Um, OK, I, I will say publicly, I'm, I'm not receiving any money from Ensemble Block. I'm just in it for the educational content. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not getting any funding from them. So I, I don't have any horse in the race here. I, I'm just happy to provide some content and for the for the greater good of education. I'm sure they, they have costs that they have to cover and all that for all their you know, storage and data and all of that. But uh, just want to say that too. I'm, I'm not like, you know, um, making money on this thing. This is just for, yes. for education. So awesome. Awesome. That's the, that's the exact sex, exact same concept and idea behind a Valley Percussion Festival. Even in our live events, we, we don't make any, a, a single penny. Uh, uh, we're the ones that organize it and, 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 and make it happen. But, you know, uh, our fees, even for our fees for our live in-person events, they're super low. We've been, we've been, what we've been doing is $150 per campus. So if you have 20 percussionists in your middle school, you pay $150 and you take all your percussionists to Valley Percussion Festival live. And uh, all we do is get that money and pay our artists and feed them and have them play for you know and have room them and uh, uh honestly we're always in a deficit uh because uh jim melharts from melharts music in mccallan texas he has so graciously for 34 years flipped the bill for the flights for the artists oh, so nice. uh that that that's 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 the way this event is run yeah. we make absolutely no monetary compensation and it's all 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 free, all, uh, uh, you know, no, no cost. And, uh, uh, we do it for the love of, of, of music and, and the passion and, and, and getting to meet amazing educators like yourself, sir. So, yeah. uh, I, I, I share your sentiment on that one. Yes. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, um, you know, it, I, uh, as, as a professor here at Sam Houston state, you know, I, I, again, was thrilled to have the opportunity to be the selector and uh, if any students out there are, are interested in knowing more about our program or what we do, you can be in touch with me. This is a great Stephen F. Uh, Stephen F. Austin. Sam Houston State is a great place for music education. I'm in our lovely concert hall here. Uh, we have beautiful facilities here, and uh, I've got a great group of students and looking to grow it over the coming years. So if any students are listening and watching at this point and want to be in touch, please be in touch. Awesome. Awesome. And just an FYI, especially uh, those of you that are in the lower Texas area, maybe the Corpus area uh, as north up as the Corpus area, maybe the Laredo area. Dr. John Lane and I were discussing the possibility of bringing him down to the RGV 
956 area and and have him do a, a big master class and if some of you uh peeps uh, uh want to have him also go and just clinic your students at your campus uh, make sure that you reach out to me and, and start letting me know so to see what's the interest out there. Because it usually happens when we bring a clinician to any uh, Valley Percussion Festival event, uh, uh, schools, neighboring schools, neighboring uh, colleges and universities want to, you know, have you as their guest artist, guest clinician. And uh, this would be a great way, right, to uh, kick off another uh, more uh, post-COVID, right, a post-COVID, you know, uh, run at our all state stuff and yeah. dr john dr john lane we are honored to have had you here today and uh one thing uh, uh about this sir once you come once to our event your family this is your home anything that you uh may want to do if you want to live stream something if you want to share something with your uh public this services uh and our channels are at your disposal 24 7 365 just let us know what you want to do and the answer is yes let's do it so you're welcome very kind. you're very very so very kind and thank you Gil, for everything that you're doing for your community and for the larger percussion community this is fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any last words that you might want to share with our listeners in general, sir, uh, in regards to the etudes? No, I just, I want to wish everybody, I hope that you have fun with these. They're challenging and rewarding uh, to work on. I think you'll grow as a result of, of going through this process of working through these etudes. If anybody has questions, uh, feel free. You can contact me through Facebook or through my university email. Um, I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there. I'm, I'm available to answer your questions as you go. Uh, I'd love to hear from people as you're working through these etudes. I'm really excited to get out and start working with students and see how they're growing and see them working through these things. I'm, I'm, cur I'm, I'm curious to see how that's going to go. I'm, I'm excited. Yes, about that. yes. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised, sir, and you're going to become aware or acquainted with parts of Texas that you probably weren't too acquainted with, those uh, districts, school districts, and you're going to yeah. be pleasantly surprised how much talent our beautiful state has. Oh, yeah. I I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, N now the big question, sir. Any services, any products, any uh, uh again services or products that you may have uh that we can you know uh get from you uh, buy from you obtain from you you know uh any uh, services we really want to know of every single one of them that you have please yeah i um I, i'm not here to sell anything i'm just here to <laughs> uh, for, for education and uh i we've already mentioned ensemble block i think that's a great resource for students I have some other performing projects that I'm involved in. I'd be happy to you know, tell you about that. I, I do a project with one of my former teachers, Alan Audie, that's called The Innocence. And uh, it's okay. about it's a social justice advocacy project. And we tour oh, all over oh. the all over the country. Um, and we're going to do so, we're going to do a show in Austin on Saturday, September 24th. If there's anybody in the Austin area that wants to come and see us perform, uh, we'll be playing in Austin. All that information is on my website. Uh, but I just, I would say, check that out. I also have an album release coming up soon with Albany oh, wow. Records. Uh, I produced, again, I'm, I'm really into, um, you know, uh, socio-political issues and advocating for things. So I, I put together a project as an album on Albany Records. It's going to be released uh, this next week, actually. They, they say the release date is August 1st, and it's called Trigger. And the idea was that artists... Uh, I got a group of composers together to respond to the issue of gun violence. And uh, so that I commissioned a number of pieces. Uh, Alan Adi, again, is involved with that. Bonnie Whiting, who is the professor of percussion up at the University of Washington. Uh, she has a group. And she was involved with this. And then I commissioned several composers. The album of that music is coming out on Albany Records on August 1st. So you can check that out. Um, my first solo album called The Landscape Scrolls was released in 2018. That's a big solo piece by the composer Peter Garland. Uh, that's available on Starkland Records. And uh, other than that, yeah, that, that's those are kind of those are kind of the things. But like I said, I'm not I'm not really here to sell anything. I'm here to just uh, you know support support you and the education in Texas. So that 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 speaks volumes of you, sir. That speak volumes of you. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, uh, one of the things that 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 that. Uh, 
uh, you know, you become aware of as, as you organize all these events is, uh, you know, we, we, we gotta, we, we do have to make a living in and, you know, yeah. guys, uh, being able to, to, uh, hire any of the artists and clinicians that we, uh, uh, present here, you know, it, it, it goes a long way, you know, uh, all the knowledge that we just heard, you know, it came at a cost. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah. we would really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think part of, uh, part of my role as a professor at Sam Houston is I have the, you know, I have the support of this institution to make yes. my living. So I, I don't, yeah. I don't have to depend on gigs. You know, I don't have to depend on that. I have the support from the university with my salary and all that, that I feel free to do events like this for service, for the, for the, for education and service of music education in the state of Texas. So that's, that's really what it's about for me. Um, I do, you know, I do endorsements for, for instruments. I'm an innovative in Yamaha and Evans and Zildjian. Um, but, uh, but you know, it's it's really about it's really about education. So, I, I I love that, sir. I love that. How do you pronounce this gentleman's name, sir? I've seen him a lot uh, around Hui. a lot. I've seen some of his videos. Huey. 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 I believe he's correct. Yes. Huey. Yuan Pan. Am I correct? Yeah. I believe so. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, Huey. If you, are, I'm sure you're watching. Uh, if you could reach out to us, the, the DM us, we would love to have you on an event, on a, on, a, on a live stream here. I've seen your stuff and it's solid, 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 world-class stuff. We would definitely like to have you uh, if you would like to do that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, okay. I think he will. Awesome. We would love to go. have you here, brother. Yeah. Wait, great. Awesome. He, uh, yeah, he, he is a, another uh, connection to Hawaii is that we both marched in the Cavaliers, so... We, oh, we wow. Share, oh, wow. We share that connection. Yeah. yeah, he's good. I've seen some of his content and he and some of his educational content and some of his performance content. And he's solid. Yeah. He yeah, saw no, it. He, yes, he's great. He's great. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been fun, fun, fun. And, and I got to admit, sir, we've done many, many uh, live streams and many live events. And this is definitely, definitely one of the, the best clinics that we have had. Uh, uh, you delivered so many gold nuggets, uh, uh, so useful. And uh, I, I actually found quite a bit of them that are new to me uh, uh, personally. So thank you so, so much. Uh, it's an honor. This is your home. Ladies and gentlemen, please follow like subscribe and share our socials so you can be aware of uh future clinics that we have oh uh quickly we've been talking uh with gavin harrison drum set player and we're trying to do something with him also joe franco from the uh hair uh metal glam era met beautiful beautiful drum set player we've been talking with him and we're going to be doing some clinics and there is a lot of content that's going to be uh uploading make sure you follow like, subscribe, share all our socials, and uh, so you can be notified when we uh, upload them. And uh, for now, guys, uh, oh, and one more thing. We have another Allstate clinic, uh, uh, by also by Dr. Brad Meyer, that we already agreed on doing. Stay up to date with us so you can be notified when that one's going to happen. And uh, one of the things that, that we have learned is when we have on, even on the same topic, when we have multiple educators, like you were saying earlier, sir, uh, you know, you have different points of views and it just expands our horizons. Yes, right. yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. John Lane, thank you so, so much, sir. Anything you ever need, we are here. Thank you so much. And see you on the next one, guys.